and thank you for joining us today for our Sigma Masters webinar, Cardiac MR in Times of COVID-19, as we highlight a very important topic affecting so many of our healthcare professionals and patients. But before we get started, we'd like to take a few minutes to review some housekeeping tips and helpful hints. At the bottom of your screen, there are multiple application widgets that you can use. All of these widgets are resizable and movable. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking the arrows in the top right corner. Under the resource list, you will find a copy of today's slide presentation and some additional helpful materials as well. I'd like to point out the most important widget on your screen, and that's the Q&A widget. At any point during this webcast, you can enter in your questions, and at the end of this talk, we'll be having a live Q&A session where a panel of experts will help provide those answers. We'll certainly do our best to get to all of your questions and get them answered during this session. However, if we cannot, we'll simply cap capture them and follow up via email. And lastly, an on-demand session of this webcast will be available to you in about a day. You'll receive an email with the accessible link. Feel free to share it with your peers. And with that, I'm honored to introduce to you our keynote speaker, someone who you likely well known. Oh, sorry, let me, can I take that one more time? And with that, I'm honored to. Um, and with that, I'm honored to introduce to you our keynote speaker, someone who is likely well known to many of you, Dr. Matthias Friedrich. Dr. Friedrich earned his MBA at the Friedrich and Alexander University in Erlangen, Nuremberg, Germany. He completed his training as an internist and cardiologist at Schottry University Medical Center, Humboldt University in Berlin. He is currently full professor with Departments of Medicine and Diagnostic Radiology and Chief Cardiovascular Imaging at McGill University Health Center in Montreal, Canada. Dr. Friedrich has authored more than 200 peer-reviewed publications with over 15,000 citations. He is a key member of international writing groups, editorial boards, and grant review committees in Europe and North America. He is also the founding president of the Canadian Society of Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance and past president of the SCMR. We are thrilled to have him here with us today. Please welcome Dr. Friedrich. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's a pleasure uh, for me to be here. And also I'm thankful for the opportunity to share with you some thoughts uh, about the use uh, and the role of cardiac MR in this extraordinary period of a pandemic that threatens the lives of so many people and uh, has upended a lot of our schedules daily. So what I will try to do in the following minutes is to first talk about the pandemic, how it affects the cardiovascular system. I will then uh, talk about the potential of cardiac MR to help uh, in the clinical workup of patients with suspected myocardial injury in the context of COVID-19. And I will also then address aspects of the safety around performing cardiac MR scanning uh, in uh, these patients. So first of all, um, uh, some disclosures here and, uh, and uh, the, the, this slide where um, GE uh, informs you about, about their role in this context. I receive uh, support from uh, industry and uh, from public funding sources for research. Uh, and, uh, I want, and I want to disclose this as a potential, uh, but not actually felt conflict of interest. I'm a board member, shareholder and advisor to uh, Circle Cardiovascular Imaging, a company that produces software. And I also receive research support from uh, GE Healthcare, among others. Okay, so what are we talking about? COVID-19 is a disease um, that is caused by a novel virus, the SARS uh, coronavirus 2, or SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So this is one of, uh, it's not the first 
variant of the coronaviruses that have been uh, around before. But the difference to previous coronaviruses is that the SARS uh, coronavirus 2 appears to be more contagious than um, most of its, its predecessors and also more contagious than regular influenza viruses. Uh, COVID-19 is the disease that results from an infection and that affects most people who are um, infected. <clears throat> Uh, many of them go through the disease uh, asymptom without any symptoms, but um, certain populations are at a substantial risks, uh, a risk, especially elderly uh, people, uh, patients with pre-existing disease, especially lung diseases and uh, cardiovascular risk. We also know that obesity appears to be a particularly strong risk factor. <clears throat> then, uh, needless to say, that immunosuppressed people are particularly vulnerable and uh, simply because of their exposure also healthcare staff and there have been uh, lots of uh, tragic reports on um, partially young doctors who uh, succumb to um, working in, in the front lines uh, of, of this disease. Now COVID-19 as a pandemic if you put that into perspective <clears throat> and into a context, uh, context of previous pandemics so far is a large it's not one of the super pandemics we had before but certainly with now uh, more than 200,000 deaths uh, among the larger ones it's now lar in terms of the death toll it's more severe than the swine flu uh, we had more severe than uh, Ebola the the previous SARS epidemic uh, more severe than the Hong Kong flu and other flus we had uh, before the the real big flus of uh, of the past and pandemics um, the AIDS uh, so far is still uh, ongoing to some extent uh, was certainly a large one the the Spanish flu so there are larger pandemics in the past but it's still different uh, because uh, not only because of the death toll but also because of the yet not fully understood impact on our societal uh, life and uh, in in the future about uh, its impact on economy and 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 healthcare so um, when we look at uh, the vulnerable uh, people uh, here we see in this graph we see that elderly people uh, have a higher mortality every year around the flu season so we see on the on the bottom of these this graph the, the the third of these lines that the age group of 65 and older every year they undergo a, basically a critical time that has been particularly critical this time you see at the right uh, border of this graph that this spike, uh, this very steep spike, that is uh, what we see now as the death toll of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. You see that it's going higher. So uh, at that time, the death toll was higher when compared to previous years. So that indicates the severity. But luckily, we also see that it may be narrower. So it may be that the overall death toll may not even be uh, at least for for this time, not higher, but uh, the, the the brutality of how the pandemic flooded certain countries uh, led to um, partially collapses of regional healthcare systems, and that's why it's so important, and and that that's why it uh, it is very very important to um, to think about how we can address this pandemic. Some countries have been more affected than others. And here you see uh, from Europe, you see that especially the, the Mediterranean countries of the West, of Western Europe, France, Spain, Italy have been hit very hard, also the UK. And as you can see, Sweden. Um, this indicates uh, another aspect that uh, those countries uh, that uh, responded very quickly with lockdowns and thereby reduced the spreading of the virus, they did better in terms of the, the deaths during that time. And uh, Norway, for example, being right next to Sweden, uh, who had a way more restrictive approach, did way better, at least so far, when we look at the death tolls. And it's also obvious here, so these are numbers uh, published in, in, the, in the Financial Times or the, the graph, uh, where you can see that the US tops the list of uh, deaths. Um, um, and you see all the countries that are higher on this graph, 
those were the countries who installed their lockdowns later, whereas those countries who uh, responded early, like Australia, Norway, uh, Austria, um, they uh, performed better. Now, that doesn't mean that in the long run, the death toll will be the same, but at least for the, for the time being, uh, apparently earlier restrictions were uh, better. I'm talking about the United States now. The United States has already passed the million uh, deaths and uh, is currently passing 60,000 deaths. Of course, U.S. has a large population, but even if you break it down per million, uh, the United States is already among the top countries, so uh, uh, more severely affected than mo most uh, other countries um, because of several uh, reasons, but um, but partially maybe because uh, the lockdowns were not very aggressively enforced uh, early enough. It is also important uh, to realize that um, during the COVID pandemic, it's not just about the people dying from COVID-19, but also people dying because they don't have access or usual access to, to health care. What we see here is that uh, over time, you see this September 9-11, that's New York. That's why we have a very focused view here. Uh, so. Uh, so 9-11 um, uh, led to an excess death here. Uh, but if we look at the right uh, of the screen, you see that um, that uh, the beginning of April uh, marked the, the wave coming in. So uh, New York has been severely affected and probably the region in, in the world so far most significantly affected. And these deaths are not only, as I said, COVID, but they're also excess deaths that are not explained by COVID-19. And this is uh, currently under discussion, probably a mix of COVID-19 not identified as such, plus patients who, what I can now, what we also can see in Montreal, waiting for urgent interventions, not being able to get that intervention, and then basically dying at home uh, because they didn't uh, receive the, the medical care they, they had needed. This slide uh, shows um, uh, one marker of the significant economic impact um, the uh, pandemic is having on the U.S. society, um, leading to large numbers of um, unemployment and also downstream effects that are not yet even well understood. Okay, so it is a serious pandemic, <clears throat> uh, but how does COVID-19, how does that work in the body? So the virus uh, enters cells uh, through the so-called ACE2 receptor, um, and that's a, a receptor that is part of our body um, physiology uh, in, involved in regulating blood uh, flow through pressure and also involved in, um, in the permeability of vessels, and that is important. So these receptors are especially prevalent in the lungs and the heart but also in the kidneys, uh, esophagus, uh, in the intestinal system, and in, even in the testicles. Um, so the virus can enter through these receptors into cells uh, after an, a period of four to six days where people may not know anything at all, uh, people uh, likely develop symptoms uh, that have been mainly uh, described as a sore throat, dry cough, fever, myalgia, uh, a little bit uh, more specifically, a loss of smell and taste. Um, all these symptoms do not necessarily have to be there, uh, but uh, most of the uh, patients have that, especially fever, the sore throat. Uh, that Those are fairly frequent signs. The loss of smell is not that frequent, but uh, seems to be more specific uh, to this disease. So after a period uh, of these relatively mild symptoms, but people may be very still maybe tired and, and uh, will stay in bed, um, uh, after another four to six days, they may devier, uh, develop shortness of breath, and that is an indicator of a more severe course of the disease. So um, in, especially in vulnerable people, uh, COVID-19 then can lead to extensive necrotic inflammation in the lungs, um, and, uh, and that is associated with a poor prognosis. Um, in a recent paper published in The Lancet, um, it, uh, the, the authors concluded that it may be uh, an inflammation of the endothelium uh, in, uh, in uh, several organs that may cause uh, this massive inflammatory uh, response uh, 
that leads to local formation of blood clots and that may explain why people uh, experience uh, sudden uh, deterioration of their respiratory function uh, and also another interesting aspect has been raised recently that maybe through the ACE2 uh, receptor uh, there is an increased permeability of the blood vessels so you have more edema and that edema has been observed, for example, in the heart, but also in the lungs, that may also play a big part. So here you can see the, the response uh, in, a, in, a, in a review by um, Eduardo Marban uh, from the Sida Sinai uh, Medical Center. So the, you have these stages of the disease. People do not necessarily have to get into the, uh, stage three, but once they get there, um, the uh, disease is mainly characterized by a very strong response of the immune system that also has been uh, called the cytokine storm. So, so that is the, um, that is the, um, uh, the response of an immune system that then uh, initiates more damage than the virus itself. And that is important to realize that's the reason why some of the young people are so, so severely affected. So this also can in involve the heart and uh, there is actually a fairly high incidence of acute myocardial injury. Uh, the numbers we have indicate that this is probably around 20%. Uh, and uh, myocardial injury is associated with poor prognosis and uh, therefore should be aggressively treated because we know that once people have acute myocardial injury, uh, 40 to 50 percent may actually die. So that's why myocardial involvement is so important. Um, as I said before, it's the inflammatory response that may be worse than the virus itself. In fact, there are papers showing that there is virus presence in the myocardium without associated inflammation. So it's not the virus itself, but it's the response of the immune system. And in the heart, this can then be reflected by um, increased biomarkers, such as the, the troponin um, that indicates myocardial injury. Um, clinically, that is reflected by arrhythmia, palpitations, uh, even sudden death, or uh, heart failure, or acute coronary syndrome because of course the coronary arteries could be involved and then you uh, you get an ischemic uh, injury and uh, the clinical outcome of these injuries then could be uh, as i uh, just here summarized uh, again uh, arrhythmia heart failure uh, or myocardial infarction um, and myocardial infarction is as an ischemic event that's when the coronary arteries are involved whereas the others they do not necessarily need the coronary arteries to be uh, involved, so they can happen through the inflammation, the widespread inflammation, inflammation itself. So what's the clinical consequence for that? And there has been a nice uh, um, consensus uh, paper published last week um, from several societies, and uh, the key phrase here is when it comes to um, to a myocardial injury is for patients who have an unclear or equivocal diagnosis of ST elevation myocardial infarction due to atypical symptoms, due to ST segment elevation or atypical ACG findings or a delayed presentation, additional non-invasive evaluation in the emergency department is recommended. So in short, if there is evidence for myocardial injury and it's not entirely clear where it comes from, then more information is needed. Uh, so we need a non-invasive further evaluation of these uh, patients. Now, just to recap, the, the major injuries we're dealing with uh, are um, acute myocarditis, so that's acute inflammation, or acute myocardial infarction. The other reasons for uh, some myocardial injury uh, could be secondary. For example, because of severe lung disease, you may have an overload of the right ventricle, and then the right ventricle may undergo some minor injury, but that's not necessarily something we can specifically or should specifically treat. Then the lungs is, uh, are the most important. Then there's also the injury caused by a septic uh, course of the disease, so the inflammation of the entire body requires so much work from the heart that the heart is not able to provide that. So we're not talking about those, but really talking about the direct injury to the heart that is either inflammation, uh, probably more through the immune response, or ischemic because of the coronary arteries uh, and their involvement. Now, uh, cardiovascular MR uh, is one of the techniques
that uh, uh, is used for imaging. And uh, here are two examples uh, of imaging. On the left side, you see that there, this is a patient with COVID and uh, with an ischemic injury. So clearly a coronary artery <clears throat> was involved and led to wall motion abnormalities. And um, in, the, in the cath lab, one could see the, the coronary arteries, uh, how they are affected. On the right side, you see a case report from Italy, uh, a patient with COVID and acute myocardial injury not caused by a coronary artery uh, problem, but by a direct inflammatory response. And here you can see uh, th that the, the cardiac MR uh, showed evidence for um, pericardial effusion. So this is the, the stuff basically around the heart in the middle, the bright stuff in the middle um, um, row. These are the T2 maps. So the very bright areas here indicate the effusion of the pericardial in the pericardial sac. And then in the myocardium itself, that's the, the short axis view here, the round uh, appearance of the left ventricle. Uh, there is evidence for myocardial edema as indicated by an increased T2 times or in the upper row by, by a high intensity of uh, especially the more apical uh, myocardium in the right upper uh, panel. It's a four chamber view. You see this bright area that indicates an increased water content consistent with myocardial edema. So here we see the two major uh, injuries we can expect in patients with COVID-19. Now cardiac MR is not only one of the imaging techniques, but I think uh, it's uh, uh, very clear that is the imaging technique to look for tissue injury and uh, to uh, for visualization of tissue pathology. So it can be used, as you can see here, for identifying uh, whether this is an ischemic or a non-ischemic injury, because ischemic injury, that's the upper row, always involves the subendocardial layer whereas non-ischemic injury rarely does so. So the, the, mere, uh, the, the mere regional um, uh, distribution of the injury indicates whether it's ischemic or non-ischemic. And if it is, um, is non-ischemic, then there are also certain patterns that provide some additional information on where uh, this non-ischemic injury comes from. So there are certain patterns associated with cardiomyopathies, with certain infiltrative diseases. So, so all of them have a certain kind of signature, um, uh, how this uh, looks like. A few of them cannot be separated that well. Uh, sarcoid and myocarditis sometimes can appear uh, similar. Uh, but uh, for most of the other diseases, uh, the regional distribution allows to um, express a strong suspicion for one of these. And of course, uh, myocarditis as an inflammation uh, can be uh, identified uh, pretty specifically with uh, cardiac uh, MR. And in this case, it's using late gadolinium enhancement. So that's a technique where you add a contrast agent. The contrast agent accumulates in areas with irreversible injury. So this is already damaged myocardium that can be visualized here. And and the regional distribution is uh, very informative. So when it comes to myocarditis itself, there are published uh, criteria. So uh, the so-called Lake Louise criteria uh, indicate um, the criteria, the parameters that can be acquired by a cardiac MR scan uh, to verify uh, inflammation and uh, even more specifically acute inflammation. Uh, the, um, there are the simple uh, summary of that is uh, there are two criteria. One is focused on edema. So it's just, uh, is there evidence for an increased water content in the heart consistent with swelling, basically with acute uh, inflammation? And second, is there already irreversible injury as uh, evident by uh, either T1 maps or the so-called late gadolinium enhancement uh, <clears throat> where you have an accumulation of the gadolinium in the areas of uh, irreversible injury. There are supportive criteria, so it's pericarditis or pericardial effusion and also dysfunction, but they are only supportive. They do not represent one of the, if you will, major criteria. But these are criteria that have been validated and they have a, a very good diagnostic accuracy and uh, cardiac MR is considered the non-invasive gold standard for verifying or refuting the, the diagnosis of acute myocarditis.
So in the COVID-19, uh, uh, it's not just about the, the, um, the accuracy of the technique, but we also have to keep in mind that the healthcare staff has to be kept safe. And that's why I want to spend a few minutes on safety aspects. Um, the virus um, is transmitted through contact with, an, with the endothelium, especially mouth, nose, eyes. The transmission happens through droplets and contaminated surfaces. Uh, longer distance aerosol transmission is possible if you have enough of the virus uh, as droplets in the air. That can reach out to one meters, two meters, and around people sneezing can be six to eight meters. And uh, so there are, have been recent uh, studies, more theoretical studies, that when jogging a distance of uh, six meters may be uh, safe enough, but less so may not. Uh, so that is that is an, an important uh, aspect because if you breathe heavily, you leave basically some of these droplets in the air, and the next jogger running uh, behind you may may uh, breathe uh, that and and then get infected. And um, it's also uh, has been also abundantly clear that in most of the countries with a severe sudden outbreak of uh, the infection, it was pretty much almost always there were uh, certain mass gatherings that served as uh, catalysts of such a rapid spreading. So that was in South Korea was a religious gathering. In, in, in Germany, it was a, a carnival. Um, in Italy, there were these uh, so-called corona parties uh, on, the, on the beaches. Then there were uh, gatherings of similar uh, impact in Florida. So we, we can trace a lot of these rapid outbreaks to these mass uh, gatherings. So that's why what we have to also consider when we talk about the healthcare staff um, if if uh, healthcare staff has to work in, in a crowded space with COVID patients, it's pretty obvious that there is a very high risk. So what does that mean for uh, MR? Um, MR itself is not uh, generating aerosols, so it's not the very high risk procedure as an intubation or resuscitation. Um, but we have to keep in mind that all patients uh, may be carriers, even if the test was negative and even if they're asymptomatic. So that's why the healthcare staff needs to have an efficient personal protective equipment. And while in Italy some people said, yeah, surgical masks are probably good enough, that's not true. Surgical masks uh, are good for the others, but not for the wearer uh, necessarily. So um, you cannot use a surgical mask and protect yourself appropriately in the presence of COVID positive patients. So that's why an N95 or FFP2, um, as it's called in Europe, a level mask is required. Face shield also unless you wear glasses to protect your eyes um, and a gown that doesn't uh, allow fluids to, to permeate uh, to the skin and, uh, and of course, gloves. So this is what should be uh, done in times of COVID uh, in, in for all uh, patients. Um, now, uh, what, what does it mean for a, a, a department? First of all, for the peak pandemic, urgent cases should be done only. Uh, patients also should wear this protective um, uh, material or this equipment to protect the others and especially the, the MR staff. The CMR protocols should be focused uh, because that reduces the time uh, the patient is uh, in the scanner and, uh, and the, uh, of course reduce the risks. Uh, the risk of have, leaving droplets somewhere. Uh, Non-contrast scans, if possible, because the, in, the insertion of an IV line uh, requires a healthcare profession to be close to the patient, thereby again increasing the risk. The careful cleaning of the surfaces, and uh, if you have critically ill or intubated patients, there, there are most of the institutions have extended cleaning protocols. So, for example, leaving the, the scanner room for half an hour for uh, proper ventilation and removal of all the aerosols. Uh, and then an extended cleaning protocol uh, for the surfaces that, that have been uh, used or potentially contaminated. So that is uh, important to keep in mind in, in during these times. Now, how could uh, MR now be involved in Included in a clinical workflow, and uh, and this is uh, this is 
how I think um, the, the, the reasonable use of MR should be part of the workflow. So patients with suspected COVID and the clinical uh, suspicion of um, acute myocardial injury, um, and uh, there are recommendations out there to check for that daily. Um, so that means uh, ST elevation in the ECG, shortness of breath that is not otherwise explained, arrhythmia or typical chest pain. So um, uh, in those patients, uh, a troponin should be uh, taken. So that's a serologic marker for myocardial cell injury. And if that's increased, then we know, okay, there is acute myocardial injury. There's currently cardiac cells are being affected. And that should trigger in centers that have access to a cardiac uh, MR uh, protocol, that should trigger a cardiac MR scan that can then differentiate normal uh, from uh, acute ischemic from acute non-ischemic injury. And all of these have certain, uh, uh, have certain specific clinical um, consequences, and that's why the MR has uh, a strong impact on clinical decision-making and also an outcome of uh, patients. So um, this is where I think cardiac MR makes uh, a lot of sense. Patients with verified acute myocardial injury uh, because then after the MR, you know how to proceed. Should, should these patients go to the cath lab? Should they uh, get aggressive heart failure treatment? Have to, they, uh, have they to, be, to be monitored for uh, arrhythmia? Uh, or if uh, the heart looks relatively normal, uh, they have to undergo further diagnostic testing for other underlying causes such as uh, lung injury. So some of uh, that uh, also will be um, published soon um, uh, as the recommendations of the SCMR. So that uh, paper is uh, currently in, uh, in the process of uh, being published. It hopefully will be out uh, in a week or so. There's one additional aspect I would like to mention here. Uh, cardiac MR is often see, or used or typically used as that what it is alone, but because patients are in the scanner, of course you could look at other organ systems. And here's a case report that is not yet uh, published. Uh, it's from Iran, uh, a patient who had a, an MR scan due to other reasons, actually for, was for, for following uh, breast uh, disease. And um, uh, that patient actually had, as, a, as incidental findings, these uh, more peripheral uh, inflammatory uh, focuses, foci um, <clears throat> here visible on the so-called, uh, on the T2-weighted imaging. So these are regional areas of inflammation, and then the patient actually turned out to ha then be mildly symptomatic and was tested positive for COVID-19. So to me, uh, that clearly indicates that um, that uh, a patient uh, could have a test for um, uh, lung infection uh, as a double rule out um, at the same time. The, the, the advantage of that is that you have just one scan to look for both pulmonary and the cardiac involvement. You don't need to even give a contrast agent to, to see that here. Uh, and it's not as good as a CT for sure, because CT has a higher spatial resolution. There's more experience with lung imaging of CT. There are certain standard protocols. Yes, all that given. But if you do a cardiac, uh, if you do an MR scan and you can do look at both, then you may spare a separate CT scan. So you may save another transport through the hospital. Uh, you may save a precious time uh, for uh, therapeutic decision-making uh, and also convenience for the patient. So I think uh, that is an important aspect that needs to be studied. Uh, in fact, we are currently running a prospective trial that looks at that, but I would also encourage others uh, to include that into their um, into their uh, protocols. So with that uh, said, I uh, want to briefly summarize. I think cardiac MR uh, in those centers that have access to an MR scanner may play a critically important role in the workup of patients with COVID-19 if uh, the patients uh, reveal signs of acute myocardial injury.
and uh, cardiac MR could be combined with uh, lung sequences, T2-weighted lung sequences, uh, to be used as a double rule out. And, uh, and therefore, I, I hope that uh, many centers will open up that path and will, uh, will, can use this for the benefit of the patients. And with that, I want to thank you and want to wish you uh, staying safe. Um, all the best for your work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedrich. Certainly an involving situation and much more to come. With that, let's now move into the Q&A session.